hip, hip, hooray for DNA. It provides the key to the plans for making everything in you and me. If you look at the evolution of living things, there's something quite interesting. This here is just a timeline of the evolution of living things. You can see that 4.5 billion years ago, this is when Earth itself roughly came into existence. Now, 3.6 billion years ago is when the first life appeared. And this was really simple, so very basic. So basically, it was just a cell, one cell. Initially, even simpler, but then eventually it was just one cell. And that stayed the same for a long time. So for many billions of years, it was more or less just steady. And then suddenly, 590 million years ago, there was a massive explosion. So what I mean by massive explosion is just, you know, we went from single cell things to a very complex living life forms. And that explosion had a couple of different reasons, but we believe there was one reason which was really important, and that was the invention, more or less, of sexual reproduction. Beforehand, all the actual organisms, so all cells, had only asexual reproduction, which meant if we had one cell, and then we divide it into two cells, the only difference between mother and uh, the, the, the father, the parent cell, and the offspring, was if there were a mutation. So if there were a mutation in DNA, there might be a tiny difference in the actual daughter cells compared to your initial cells, but that variation is just still hard to have because it's just tiny. Whereas once sexual reproduction came around, there was a lot more variation, which means if we have more variation, we have more chance of evolution and natural selection taking its normal steady form. So a lot more variation, and we'll go over why that variation was there, and we'll get back to this picture at the end as well. So the dot point itself says explain the role of gamete formation. Gamete formation, a gamete is just a sperm or an egg cell, so how a gamete, so the role of gamete formation and sexual reproduction in variability of offspring. So how do the production of sperm and eggs and sexual reproduction lead to that difference in offspring? That's what we're going to have to talk about in this video. Now, before I start, again, I'll quickly talk about gamma formation. And the idea of gamma formation is just that we have eggs and sperm being produced from our original cell. And remember, our original cell had a diploid number of chromosomes. And what that meant is it has a full set of chromosomes. It's a full set. And in our case, that means we have 46 chromosomes. So we'll use the example of a human in this video. We have 46 chromosomes initially, and that means we have, remember there's this home, this, this set, so we have these groups of identical ones, always come in sets of two, the homologous chromosomes, always in sets of two, so we have 46 chromosomes, we have 23 of these sets of two, and that's in our original cell, but our eventual, so our sperm neck cells, they have a haploid number of chromosomes, and that means they only have the half number. So got, in this case, 23 chromosomes. And this, so they had this set here where we have two identical ones, where just the alleles might be a bit different. But now what happens is we just select one of them. We select either, in this case, either the pink one will be in one sperm, and the other one might be in a different sperm. So they separate. So that was more or less the gist. And obviously, gamma formation occurs through meiosis. Meiosis produces different types of gametes. And in meiosis, you should also remember that there was something called crossing over, which occurs roughly here. And in crossing over, we have just swapping of bits of the chunks of the of the chromosomes get swapped over. We'll go over that in a second. And then eventually, as I mentioned, they segregate, and we have from our 20, 46 original chromosomes, our all of our eggs and our sperm cells only have half the number of 23. So what I'll do now is I'll just randomly pretend to produce an egg in a sperm cell from our original cell. So this here is our chromosomes of our original cell. Remember I said we have 23 of sets. So we have 46 chromosomes, 23 of these homologous pairs. But what I have here is I only have three pairs, right? So five, sorry, five pairs. Because I'll make it a bit simpler. You can imagine if there's 20, if I have to do 23, it'll be quite messy. So I'll just do it for five, but you can imagine it'll, for 46 is what actually happens. And for 23 pairs is what actually happens. But I'm only gonna do it with five. So this is the original amount, right? and then what you have to do is you have to pick randomly, just pick them. So you can say, okay, well, 
we have to start with the first pair for our egg production, and it's going to be either this or this, and it's going to randomly select one. It's going to be fifty percent chance. Let's say okay for the first one we took a green one, and uh, sorry, a yellow one, and then for the second pair, okay, let's say this time it chose randomly the small pink one, and then for the third set, okay, again choose chose randomly chose that snaky S looking one. These are all different types of chromosome pairs. And for the last fourth one, it took that yellow seven-looking chromosome. And for the fifth one, it took the actual pink weird-looking one again. And now it has, again, this would go on until 23 sets have been done. And what can also happen is that crossing over. So there might be, you know, for this here, when it shows the green one and the green one, the yellow one, there might have been a bit of the actual pink being crossed over. So this might not be fully yellow. It might be a bit of yellow and a bit of pink. And the same with this snaky one. This might not be full pink, the one that was selected, but it might have a bit of mostly pink, but it maybe have a bit of yellow. That has that crossing over, the idea of crossing over. And now the same thing happens again for the sperm. So we select random for the first set. Okay, there might be the blue one selected. These, these are here. These are the identical ones to the earlier ones. They're meant to be the identical chromosomes. Now, but in this case, the blue one was selected. For the second one, the smaller one, we had maybe a green one selected. Then for the last, next one, we had maybe a blue one again selected. And this is random process, random process. For that seven looking one, again, maybe another blue one selected. So a blue seven looking chromosome. And for the last one, maybe a green one selected. Again, 50% chance. So you know, have different types of ones being produced. And then what's going to happen is, again, there might be a bit of crossing over. So when we select the original blue one, it might not have been completely blue. It might have, before it actually segregated, it might have had a bit of green attached as well. So this might be a bit of green here. And the same thing happened maybe for the last one as well. Before it actually moved across, there was a bit of blue in that green, swapped over before at the crossing over stage. So it's mostly green, but a bit of blue as well. And so you can see now that you know, this would have happened again. This would have happened for another 23 times. But you can see that the variation is already quite a bit of variation. It's going to be quite different to the original one. There's swapping over that occurred, crossing over, and overall the random selection of, of chromosomes. And we often hear here this you know, phrase one in a billion, that you, know, you are one in a billion. And according to those statistics, according to how, this, how gamut formation actually works, the chances of you being produced again, like the same chromosome combination, even if your parents had a billion children, the fact that the chance that you would be, there'd be someone which would be looking identical like you, have the same chromosomes, the same sequence of chromosomes, would be less than one in a billion. So you would be, you know, that's why if they say you're one in a billion, you're, it's actually true, you're more or less extremely unique. It'd be impossible to try to naturally produce you again. Now, when it comes to fertilization, so that was good gamma formation. And we said, okay, there's so much variation as possible in gamma formation because of all the how it, segregation works and how crossing over works and all of that. But then this next step is fertilization where we actually have the egg and the, and the actual sperm come together. Remember here, this is the egg. So this is how fertilization occurs. Fertilization is, is sexual reproduction. So that's what we're talking about, about at the moment now. We've done the, the gamma formation. Now we're talking about sexual reproduction. And we've had... The egg here, we only have, we produce four eggs, but actually only one is fertile. So this is the one egg that was fertile. And males produce many millions of, of sperms, but only one will actually win out. So this one was the one that won out, and it's going to put its DNA and combine its, DNA, its chromosomes and DNA with the female egg's chromosomes and DNA, and you have going to have a zygote being produced. So first, this was the egg here, so I'm going to have the egg in this overall area. Remove this. So this was the egg. And the egg is bigger than the actual sperm. And you have the winner of sperm. So this one was the one who won the race. All the other ones were out of luck. They didn't survive or didn't make it first. And this sperm will invade or well, just penetrate the actual wall of the egg and then also be inside. And then we'll have a recombination, which means that it's going to line up and we're going to have a diploid number of chromosomes, a full set of chromosomes again. So now I'm just going to again join them together. So we had this chromosome here from 
was our first one for our female, and this one was the first one for our male. They were meant to be the identical ones. Uh, they are together again, and that's the diploid number. The small one was from our female, and then we have that small one, which was the green one from the male, from the sperm. And we said we had the S looking one, the pink one, with a bit of yellow one from the female. And we had the S, the blue S, we took that from the male. We took the seven from seven looking chromosomes, it's not a seven, it looks a bit like a seven, from the female, the yellow, and then we had a bluish one from the actual male. And then we had a squiggly line. Supposed to also be supposed to be chromosome from the female, and these are meant to look identical. Obviously, they don't look identical, but they're meant to look identical. These two, these pairs, and this one from the male. So now I can see this here. If you look at how these look, so compare these ones to original ones. Either the male sperm or the female egg, they look very different, right? There's lots of things that have happened, and now the combinations look very different, which means that's what we call variation. Right? They have change. They're different from the original ones. Just because of that combination of crossing over, of segregation of chromosomes, and then that combination again, that fertilization, all this, those three combined increase the variation to a high, high level. Which is why, you know, if you look at how this offspring, so this might be a baby, and if this baby were to be compared in terms of characteristics to the parents, they would have some shared characteristics because they do share the same genes and chromosomes. But there will be lots of differences as well, just because of the way this actually works. So you, you know you won't be able to say for definite that they, that they look exactly like the female or like the male parent because they're just a combination, and yeah, there's a lot of differences. And if we were to try to produce this baby again, the same combination of genes, that's more. That's not. It's not impossible, but it's highly unlikely. Right, so that was the idea of gamma formation and sexual reproduction. Now we we'll go back to the original point: was you know, how can sexual reproduction have increased evolution or made evolution go faster? Well, if we have so much variation, that means we have a lot more variation. And a lot more variation means that if we have, for example, changing environments, that means there's lots of different types of variations and the best ones will be selected against. So the best variations will be selected. That's through natural selection. And that means that you're going to have more variation, which means more natural section itself occurs on the higher level, and that means more evolution will occur as well. That's just on a side note. That wasn't the dot point. The dot point itself says, explain the role of gamma formation and sexual reproduction in the variability of offspring. So offsprings are different because both gamma formation, when it comes to crossing over and segregation of chromosomes, and fertilization, when both the egg and the sperm fuse, that increases variability to high degree. And that means, obviously, that the, and then you know, the reason why it affects the variability is to, have, to such a high degree were the reasons what we mentioned just now. And you should also know that yet yeah, it's very unlikely to have a baby which would be identical just because of how meiosis and fertilization works. I hope that was useful. Thank you for watching.